We are having a conversation with Dr. Lawrence White. He is professor of economics at George Mason University. Dr. White, you advocate free banking. And in these days, many people blame bankers and the financial system for uh, the crisis. Isn't free banking like uh, unleashing the beast? Well, free banking actually is leashing the beast in the most effective way, which is by competition. Right? If the beast is uh, too much credit being created without any justification, the worst excesses we find are central banking systems uh, where there's pressure on the central bank to keep interest rates low or to stimulate uh, employment. Uh, a central bank is unconstrained uh, in the amount of money it can create. Even back in the days when central banks were constrained by gold standards, it was a very loose leash. A free banking system decentralizes the creation of money. Uh, and you may think, well, then if anybody can overissue, you'll get more emission of credit. But it sets competition at work restricting individual banks. Uh, a bank that wants to get into the game has to, uh, in the 19th century, it worked this way, uh, make its deposits and its banknotes redeemable for some more basic money. And in the 19th century, it was gold. And then people who have claims on the bank uh, are not compelled by any law uh, to hold them. They can redeem them if they have more than they want, or they can spend them, or they can deposit them in their own bank. And so any bank that issues excess amounts of money will find the money returning to it for redemption. Uh, and so the competition, the being surrounded by lots of other banks that are drawing in its uh, liabilities will put a very tight leash on any individual bank of issue. Right? So it's constrained by the fact that it's part of a competitive banking system, and no bank can get out of line with the rest of the system. But then the responsibility to be responsible is for the bankers. Yes. <laughs> uh, and it's important to make or to enforce the responsibility on bankers for being responsible. Uh, in a free banking system, in a competitive, decentralized banking system, we can afford to let any one bank fail, uh, and we can hold a bank accountable for mistakes it makes. Uh, the problem with central banking is we have no way of holding the central bank accountable uh, and responsible for the mistakes it makes, and it makes big mistakes. And what about the responsibility of the depositors? Well, so depositors will uh, have to shop around, uh, have to evaluate the banks for safety and soundness. Uh, and in that way, a bank that begins to behave erratically or in a risky fashion will be disciplined uh, by losing business to other banks. And um, what if central banks worked? Why free banking and not central banks? <laughs> what if pigs could fly? Um, I mean, the historical record, I think, is pretty clear that uh, central banking doesn't work, uh, has not been successful at mitigating business cycles, but rather has made business cycles bigger. Um, and I mean, the, the theory explains why that should be so, but the history tells us that it is so. And uh, you mentioned that free banking worked in the 19th, 19th century. Why, did, why, why the shift? Well, uh, the main reason I think that governments were eager to foster central banks is that they wanted to borrow money from them. Uh, it was a fiscal motive. Uh, by monopolizing the issue of currency, which is the sort of leading edge of central banking, uh, governments created a privileged institution which they could then come to and say, uh, to keep your privileges, you need to lend us money at low interest rates. That's the historical origin of the Bank of England, the Bank of France, many of the other leading uh, central banks of the world. So do governments have incentives to uh, control the financial system and uh, don't let it be free? Well, in that respect, uh, right. If, if there's a fiscal advantage to the government in monopolizing the issue of uh, 
currency and in uh, taxing the creation of deposits as a source of revenue. They have an interest in doing that. Um, now, we, we have discussed um, free banking vis-a-vis -vis central, central bank. Uh, what about 100% uh, reserve system? Well, there are some economists who think that uh, banks should be compelled or legally required to keep 100% reserves behind their deposits. Um, I'm not against people who want to have that kind of account. Uh, that means you're not really dealing with a bank in the usual sense, but a warehouse. Uh, it's not really a bank because it's not making loans now. It's just storing your money for uh, your later use. Uh, I'm perfectly fine with people who want to use the services of a warehouse, but what I argue is that there should be freedom of contract for those people who would rather uh, use the services of a bank. And why would they rather? Because you have to pay storage fees to a warehouse. A bank that lends your money out doesn't have to charge you storage fees, and in fact, they can pay interest on your account, and competition will compel them to pay interest on uh, your account. So it's a question of what risk-return combination you'd prefer, and there's no reason to impose one size on everyone, which is the perfectly safe but no return, and in fact, you have to pay for the services. Uh, if the only reason people put money in a bank was that they wanted storage and safekeeping, then they would want a warehousing contract. And today, people who want that put their money in a safe deposit box. They don't lend it to the bank. They lock it up in a box inside the bank, and the bank is not allowed to touch it. Right? But people who want the services of a bank in making payments, they want to be able to write checks, or in the 19th century they wanted to be able to use banknotes, preferred to deal with banks who put their money to work and shared the returns with, with the customers. So 100% system applies to all kind of uh, deposits? It would apply to any deposit, uh, in, in what the advocates are, of it are saying, it should apply to any deposit which is uh, redeemable on demand or any banknote that's redeemable on demand, which has to be the case if you can use the account for writing checks. Now, this leads me to a question that may seem very elementary, but uh, I think it's, it's useful. Um, what is a bank? What does a bank do? Uh, the standard definition of a bank is an institution that both takes deposits, that is, gathers money in small amounts from many customers uh, and makes loans. Right? So banks have traditionally, there aren't any very sharp dividing lines between banks and other financial intermediaries uh, uh, like uh, loan companies or investment banks. Uh, but that's the basic definition of a commercial bank. So they, they gather money in small amounts from lots of customers. Um, they provide typically uh, and then turn around and lend it out. So they intermediate, as economists say, between savers and borrowers. And they combine that with uh, providing payment services because there's a natural synergy between those two activities um, when you have fractional reserve banking. And uh, finally, in the face of the crisis and the new rules for the financial system, do you foresee that the banking activity is about to change or will change in the future? It's always difficult to forecast to what uh, politicians and regulators will do, but they seem to be moving in the direction of placing a heavier hand of government on the banking system, um, restricting the activities that banks are allowed to uh, engage in, imposing taxes and uh, portfolio restrictions on banks. So, I mean, I fear that we're moving in the direction of less financial innovation and uh, poorer terms for bank consumers. And that will have an effect on production, on new jobs, on new products? It would lead to a slower rate of growth in the economy, yes. And that will be bad, or not. That will be bad, for, uh, to make a neutral statement, for people who prefer prosperity to poverty. Okay. Thank you very much for sharing these ideas with us, and thank you.